I want to welcome you to the Pro Mindset Podcast. The Pro Mindset Podcast is all about diving into the headspace that results in championship performance. High performing athletes, winners, have this mental flow and have a positive headspace for their performances and success. Join me, Craig Doman, sports attorney and NFL agent, on this podcast. I will interview pro athletes, college athletes, football coaches, and sports personalities. Together, we can discover how you can get in the flow and have your own pro mindset. Okay, pro mindset. We have a special guest today, Greg Scruggs. Two-time Super Bowl champion, was a member of the Seattle Seahawks and the New England Patriots Super Bowl winning teams. Greg was a seventh rounder. Greg, when were you drafted? 2012. The year after the lockout, 2012, drafted by the Seattle Seahawks to the, uh, or from Louisville, the Louisville Cardinals football program. Today we played in a golf outing that supports the Boys Hope program, the Boys Hope, Girls Hope program. You were a member of that. You were a, you were a participant. Uh-huh. You were a member. Um, why don't you share for the audience the, the genesis and the purpose behind that program? Yeah, I think the easiest way to put it when I talk to people is that Boys Hope, Girls Hope gives underprivileged kids privileged opportunities. And so our motto literally is to take at risk youth who are academically capable um, and giving them the opportunities and resources to succeed to college and through college. So that's the literal, or that's kind of the formal way to put it. But essentially the easiest way to say it for Boy Soap, Girl Soap is we give underprivileged kids privileged opportunities, period, period. So how did that impact you as a young man in Cincinnati, Ohio? Well, when I came out of when I came out of like grade school, I only had one I only had one option, man. Like graduate high school and figure out what in the world was going on. So once I now see this program that tells me I'm going to be able to go to this school that is a school that is known for uh, high academic standards and for high achieving students. And then as a result of going to the school, it'll, it will improve my chances of being able to go to college. Um, it now changed my mindset, right? Like I'm now no longer thinking about what am I going to do when I graduate high school? I'm thinking about when I'm going to college and where I'm going to college and, uh, what I'm going to major in and where this career is going to lead me now. In full transparency, I had no idea what the hell that meant at the time, but it still was a change in mindset from just wanting to graduate high school to now um, wanting to go to college. And that made all the difference in the world to me um, because it obviously would open up the door for many more opportunities for careers and uh, networking and people that I would meet and, you know, seeing all the different possibilities there were as opposed to my little bubble of either, you know, becoming the, trying to strive to become the manager at the McDonald's um, up the street or becoming a city worker or whatever the case may be. Which are cool. They're cool. I just didn't know any better. And I only wanted to be the manager because my mind never thought about being the owner or the franchiser of this restaurant. So... As a result of the program, going to this school opened my eyes to meet people and see different things um, that I never uh, would have seen otherwise or thought about otherwise. Sounds like to me, Boys Hope, Girls Hope gave you a perspective that you didn't have before, gave you hope, gave you a vision and maybe gave you uh, a goal to shoot for that perhaps you didn't have before. Yeah, fair enough. Um definitely gave me a vision um, of something that I never saw and definitely gave me something to shoot for, which I'm forever grateful to. Um, I'm forever grateful for because it's not that my mom didn't give me, also give me that vision or leave the door open for me to take advantage of that vision or those opportunities. It's just that my mom was a realist and understanding that, you know, sometimes 
these are the ways the chips fall or the, the cards, the, the hand that you're dealt. And son, I don't know. I literally can't get a loan good enough to qualify you for school. So instead of lying to you about how we're going to do it, this is what you're going to have to do. So giving me the vision, but also giving me the resources and connecting me to the right people to make college a reality is what changed, you know, a lot for me as a result of the program. Well, today you gave the keynote speech to the golfers, really pumped everybody up in terms of being motivated to contribute to the cause. And you mentioned something that was very profound, which was, you know, when you have an opportunity of a lifetime, you must act within the lifetime of the opportunity. Uh So I would like for you to share what that means to you. Well, I was told that by uh, Lauren Landau. And um, Lauren Landau is, to me, one of the most influential people in my career because he shaped the way not only that I thought about myself, my opportunity, but I thought about training. Now, that's a completely different conversation, but he made me think about training. I was no longer just showing up and doing what somebody told me to do and going home. That's important to say because it will make sense why he would tell me something like that. <clears throat> that when the opportunity of a lifetime presents itself, you must act within the lifetime of that opportunity. The context of that conversation was just, was just my rookie year, just talking about the opportunity that I had. Don't count, you know, don't count your chickens before they hatch. Don't look at the depth chart. Don't look, don't, don't try to count the days and don't try to count the reps and don't try to cheat the system. What he was telling me was, man, come on, you have the opportunity to change your life and anything and everything that it takes to change your life. You have to do it. A lot of people get the same opportunity that I have or that other people have. It's just that we're not willing to act within that window. It, we get this false sense that all of a sudden people or opportunities or chances are plentiful and the window is always open. And so as a professional football player, that meant a lot to me because he was essentially saying to me, son, listen, when you come into this place to train, this is the only opportunity you have to train. So train. That's it. This today. This is all we got. And then when you go to training camp, that rep that you take, that's the only chance you have to take that rep. You won't get that one back. So you must do it. And while I didn't walk around with that quote on my chest or on a T-shirt and I didn't put that quote in my locker, um, it was something that resonated so true to me because as professional athletes and as people, we only get a certain amount of opportunities and it is with within the lifetime of that opportunity that we must make the most of it, that we must take advantage of it, and that we must be most prepared for it, which some people would call luck, right? Luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right? It is in with, within the lifetime of that opportunity that we have to act. And if you can subconsciously instill that into your body, then consciously you have no choice but to act upon it, which I believe will yield people who work twice as hard, make the sacrifices, train twice as hard, um, take care of their body, do their job, have a purpose behind their job, or have a a willingness to do whatever it takes to be the best at what they do. If they understand that this opportunity is limited. And most people, I won't say most, that's a generalization that I can't apply, but I think a lot of people don't, don't think about life that way. And it's easy for me because I've been in a profession where my job was day to day. A lot of people in the real world have jobs that are not day to day. And they, unless something drastic happens, they could slack off a little bit and have their job tomorrow. So for somebody who is in the profession of having a day to day job, I don't care what anybody tries to tell me. There, there's very few jobs that are as cutthroat as the NFL. So for somebody who has a day-to-day job and has to figure out how to operate within a day-to-day job, you have no choice. You have absolutely no choice but to take advantage of the lifetime of that opportunity because it's only for that day. 
and for that moment. We've all seen we, people get cut during practice. I don't know. Absolutely. You know, you cut during practice or the right after the practice, right before the practice. So, um, yeah, that's that's what it means. It, it basically, if I could sum it up into a nutshell, Craig, it means shut up and get your ass to work. Period. Because you don't know if you're going to have this chance tomorrow. You don't. And that's with anything, not just football. When you step out into your when you step out into your workplace, when you step into your field or your line of work, you should approach every single day as if this is the last day or last opportunity to have to do I have to do this job. Because the truth and the reality is, if you were to give this job up, there's somebody somewhere who's yearning for your job for half the pay, willing to do twice as much work. Fact. That's a fact. One of the things that I've seen is that a lot of players don't realize the opportunity they had until they've already got their pink slip. They're taking the shuttle to the airport to fly home. The one thing about the NFL, it's not a one-way ticket. It's a round trip. And unless you take care of your opportunities and, and build a career, there's always a return trip waiting for you to go home. Uh-huh. Every NFL team budgets to fly a bunch of guys home after training camp. Uh-huh. And that's when the dudes figure out that they didn't capitalize on the opportunity that they had. Uh-huh. Okay? So that quote is prophetic. And the thing that I've always used is don't count your reps. Make the rep that you have count, uh-huh. and you'll get more. Uh-huh. Where a lot of players measure their performance on how many reps they got. Uh-huh. Well, if they're average reps... There may be, there may not be a tomorrow. Uh huh. Fair. Uh huh. Okay. So let's shift gears, and let's move into you as a player in the NFL. What was your, what was your biggest adversity that you faced when you were playing in the NFL? Well, I think there's two. Right for me in my particular story, there's my um, physical adversity, and then there was my mental adversity. And the mental adversity could be broken down even more. So the first part of my mental adversity was getting over the fact in a place like Seattle where you're so accepted and you're so welcomed and everybody's so great and everybody's so enthusiastic about you and being here. The first part getting over was that, yo, this let's just keep it straight that this is a business. It was hard to grasp that concept because as a draft pick, here I am, they chose me. Seventh round or first round, they had however many chances, and they chose 10 picks, and I was one of the 10. So that was the first part of the mental adversity that I faced. The other part of the mental adversity that I faced was being able to go out to work every day, understanding or knowing that you might be on the chopping block. What's that like when, you know, as you mentioned before, you know, if you're working at the post office, the bank, the insurance company, the law office, Unless you commit fraud or don't show up for work or or do something stupid, you're going to have your job the next day. In the NFL, you could do your job. You could do your job very, very well and still get cut. Yeah. Well, we got to get a benefit of the doubt, too. Um, I think we have to to those workers because you've never been a postal worker and neither have I. And while, we, while on the surface it's seemingly that you know, cut and dry that they'll have their job for as long as they do at least a bare minimum. We can't say that for sure. So I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But the one thing that I can say for sure is about the NFL and that pressure to show up every day. I hear people talk about pressure and I hear professional athletes try to downplay pressure. And I hear them say pressure is a mom trying to put food on the table. Pressure is a mom trying to do blank. Pressure is these different things. And while that is that is pressure, don't tell me that performing in these intense environments and situations is not pressure. It's all relative. And so it is a lot of pressure. It is a it's it's a lot of pressure to show up every day knowing that you may be the one that be that may be last on the list or may be the one that gets the axe and you just moved your family here, rent an apartment, got a lease, moved your car, shipped your car, right? That's pressure. And until you can get comfortable with that pressure, 
I think you will struggle. For me personally, I had people such as you that talked to me about the reality of the situation. And it was the the kind of old adage that it's never as good as you think and it's never as bad as you think. So you might as well go right down the middle of the road and react to whatever happens. And so when I had people who would tell me, no, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. And in some situations say, I don't think it's as good as you think it is, or I don't think it's that good. People need those people in the corners to alleviate that pressure. Because if I, if you tell me that it's not that good, and I thought it was, now all of a sudden I'm anxious. If I'm thinking it's terrible, or if I think I'm absolute trash, and you tell me, well, I'm not as bad as I think I am, well, now I got another set of pressure to try and bring up my standards or bring up my play or bring up my level of competition so that there is no question about what I have. When people have somebody in their corner to talk them off of the ledge or, in a simpler way, to humble them from one one end of the spectrum to the other, I believe success is... Uh, um, inevitable because they have no choice but to run even kill. When you go through the draft as a as a young man that's never played in the NFL, what was the biggest myth for you as a player that you thought was true, but once the draft was over, you blew it up? You're like that. That's BS. That's not true. Yeah, that's a tricky one. I, you know, given that nobody in my family had really excelled at like this level in sports and had this opportunity and did things like this, it was, I didn't, I can't really say I had any myths at all. Like every day I was, every day was a first day of learning about something, you know, um, I, you know, you obviously see as the draft became a more apparent, right. The whole walking across the stage thing, right. And the whole, um, you know, the whole kind of, um, you know, dog and pony show or the whole ordeal that, uh, that kind of was a, an image in my mind that was quickly destroyed. But what I will say on the converse of what probably a lot of people will say was that the myth that I had was that the seventh rounder got treated like trash, right? The last pick guy was treated like trash. No chance. I did everything they did except for get my Jersey shown at an introductory press conference, which was only the first rounder. Russell didn't even get his jersey shown at an introductory press conference, <laughs> right? Um, right? So there was nothing. We all flew out there together on the same day. We all had the same treatment, and maybe it was my experience from my organization, which I'm grateful for, but we all got, you know, we all had our little, um, we all had our little panel with our picks. We all got our interviews after practice. We all, in that particular order, um, um, uh, the we all had our uh, particular, um, um, you know, uh, days that that we were able to do things right, and maybe it was my organization that handled it this way. But you know, it was hard. It's hard to say that I had any other myth because I was learning on the go simply because nobody in my family had ever been through this type of experience before. So everything was new to me, and everything was. Just learn. So I didn't have really any expectations except for what showed up. Gotcha. Okay. So let's let's move into the rookie world. Greg, you're you're a you're a draft pick and I don't care if you're the last guy, Mr. Irrelevant. It is a special honor to be drafted by the NFL. Mm-hmm. Given the fact that there's so many people that could be drafted, that want to be drafted, that train to be drafted, that hope to be drafted that don't. Right. And so it truly is an honor to be in that situation, even if you are a seventh rounder. And so when you go in as a rookie, what is your mindset? What was your, and maybe this is two questions. What was your mindset going into your rookie year? And knowing what you know now, what would you tell your 22 year old self if you could do it again? Well, my mindset going in was that I don't want to get cut. And it ran along the same lines of – it ran along the same kind of premise and basis of that I don't want to disappoint my mom or my family. And so I was willing – I know that – and just from preparation from people around, you know, you and I talked a lot around that time, 
I was willing to do whatever it took to make a team, and I didn't care. Um, and the, the stuff that I'm very proud of now. So my mindset was no ego. I'm not him, whoever him is. I'm, I'm me. Do what you've always done and do whatever it takes to make a team. Um, walk in that building every day as if you don't know if you're going to have a job. If I could go back over and do it again and tell my – the only thing I would tell my 22-year-old self, because I'm pretty proud of the the way I approach my days, it would just be uh, be a little more adamant um, or be a little more intentional about being a pro. The extra film study, the asking of the questions, the extra work after practice, the, the little minute things and taking care of your body that it took me a couple of years to figure out um, to, how to do consistently. It, it was it, it, that probably would have been it. You know, be be um, be a little more intentional about being a pro. But as far as my mindset and going, I wouldn't have changed anything. I don't think you could have been more nervous as a young guy than I was because I felt more nervousness than the priority priority free agents. For whatever reason, I felt like um, I, I felt like I did or I that they had more invested in those people than they did in me because I didn't understand the draft process. I really didn't. I had no clue about the draft process, so my understanding was that I was the late-round pick. Who cares about the late-round pick, right? This is my mind at the time. Who cares about the late-round pick, right? They got these guys that they wanted to put in my position for cheap. They did me because at the end of the day, they're all tired. They just want to go have a beer and a Coke and dinner. The draft process is over with. Now it's all on the coaches, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I don't think I could have been any more nervous going into my training camps or approach my days with any more attention to detail outside of the the the, uh, the small things that you learned about being a pro. Because I walked in that building not trying – I wasn't walking in that building with an arrogance. I wasn't walking in the building that I got that I got drafted. I wasn't walking in the building trying to flaunt or tell people about myself. I walked in that building scared as hell that every day I was going to get cut. And I was going to work my butt off because effort and attitude and energy and focusing on trying to get my technique right and knowing the play, those weren't going to be the reasons. You're going to cut me. You had to cut me simply because you didn't like me or because there was somebody who was flat out better. And I knew that based on what I had been trained, how I was trained in college and how I trained coming out of college, I wasn't going to find, in my mind, I wasn't going to find too many people who were better as long as I continue to do the things I was supposed to. So that was my mind. I wouldn't have changed much about that. I just would have been a little more intent on being a pro. Gotcha. Well, today you are in a very um, influential position at the University of Cincinnati, mm-hmm. being able to help young men make decisions about their careers, uh, their academic lives, their life after football, um, help them navigate through football while they're playing it in college, and some of those guys are going to get opportunities to go to the NFL. What is the one thing that you share with them that you wouldn't know that you wouldn't have been able to share with them, but for the fact that you did it? Okay. What is the one thing that you want to make sure that you impress upon these these young men that look up to you and respect you and listen to you? Uh, the first thing I always I will always want to impose on them is that like this football thing that ain't everything for you. I got a number right here on my board, Craig, and it's a rough estimate. It's point zero 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 two one three three repeated is the number is the percentage of people who get drafted out of the people in this world, right? And that number will increase slightly if you were to cut the world directly in half and make half of it women, half of it uh, men. Is the percentage of people who get who get drafted into the National Football League. So because of that slim number, understand the importance that your football, you have to have more to say for yourself than I can run fast, jump high, catch, tackle, throw a ball, whatever the case may be. That's number one. Number two is this, is that consider being drafted an honor and a privilege. It is. And so if you think that you're just going to roll out the ball and do everything that a coach asks you to and that's it, and that you'll be drafted, you stand no chance. There's 250-some-odd people that get drafted every year out of a few thousand that are eligible, okay? That's it. And so I'm trying to help them understand 
the exclusivity of being drafted, but more so what it takes to join that club because you can't join that club by just doing the bare minimum. So I, I hit them first in my job as a student athlete, and then I go focus primarily on the athlete part of it, which is, listen, I understand everybody has a goal of being wanting to be drafted. It is an honor and a privilege, and I mean that in every sincere of the honor and privilege word when you get drafted to play in the National Football League and be drafted there. And so to get there, they're only taking the best of the best, the cream of the crop, from pick number one to Mr. Irrelevant, right? That is entitled only. He still had to get picked by somebody right? And so trying to impart that knowledge on them and trying to share with them that, that, listen, you can't just roll out of bed and do this. You have to be intentional in your work. If you look around and see a whole bunch of people doing the same thing that you're doing, I got news for you, bro. You're not doing enough. You have to be a leader. You have to do your best to separate yourself um, both on the field and off the field from the rest of the group because the people who get a chance to play and are drafted are simple and are, are special in my mind, in my opinion. I didn't think this about myself at the time, but reflecting over my time in the league and reflecting over the the, the, the people who don't get this chance and who haven't had the opportunity, it, it's become apparent to me that this is is that 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 is what it takes. And so I I take those two principles and run with them, you know, because being more than an athlete consists of you know, obviously education is a big part of it, but how you carry yourself, how do you talk, how are you meeting people, how are you network? that's big. And that's big for you as a football player too, but in my unique position, I understand that on every team there's only going to be one, one, maybe one, maybe one, and maybe two guys that are going to be drafted. So helping them understand and navigate those waters for those who won't have that opportunity. And then the second part is really focusing on the ones who want to go play because that is still a dream and it is a reality for a lot of people and saying this is what it takes for you to separate yourself. And I've been uniquely blessed to be in that position where I always tell the guys, I've been where you've been and I've gone to where you want to go. This is what I've learned along the way. And this is what I'm sharing with you today. Separate yourself, be special, train hard. Greatness requires you to look around and not see a lot of people doing the same thing that you're doing. If you look around and do see that, understand that you're not doing what you think, you're not separating yourself the way that you think you are. So that's the message I try to I try to hammer home. Be that's it. excellent. That's excellent. Mm-hmm. That's excellent, Greg. A fair amount of people I've spoken with that are in your shoes, mm-hmm. former players, mm-hmm. they talk about eliminating the what ifs. And I really believe that what you just described you know, especially if you want to be great and you're doing what everyone else is doing, you're not going to be great. It might be good, but it's probably average. Right. But if you want to be great, greatness allows you to eliminate the what ifs because the what ifs don't show up until later. Yeah. The what what ifs are in the rear view mirror. They're not the now. They're not, they're not tomorrow. They're yesterday. Mm-hmm. And I really feel like for athletes, one of the things that makes sports great it, it has an addictiveness to it that when you're out of it, you still think you can do it. Mm-hmm. And when you're out of it, you reflect on how you could have done it better. Mm-hmm. And if you can eliminate the what ifs and the now, then when you're done, because a lot of young men never going to, never going to play in the NFL, never going to get a sniff from the NFL. Yep. Are they doing, especially at the college level, what are they doing right now? to eliminate the what ifs yep. so that whatever the best case scenario is, it happens. And, yep. you know, and kind of switching gears, being in the agent business, the thing that I've learned is that if a player is talented, committed, good work ethic, coachable, fits the culture of the organization, they give you three years. Now, it's not automatic, not automatic. You've got to earn it every year, but they'll give you three. Yeah. And then there's a higher level of scrutiny after three because they start looking at, well, maybe we should get a, a replacement. Maybe we should draft somebody at his position. Maybe we should get somebody that's younger, cheaper, healthier. And so the goal of players, they, they don't want to think like this, but what it really should be is I want to outlive and outplay my shelf life. And if you can play seven, nine, 12 years, you've doubled, tripled your shelf life. And so – at the end of the day, I feel like when I'm helping young men, you know, through this process, it's understanding that they're going to try to get rid of you. 
And the draft yeah. is how they do it. And, you know, I don't know exactly who you took, whose spot you took, but you made it from the jump and you took somebody's spot. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and I think, and I think that trying to, you know, how do you impart that, like the fight that I have, right? I got a hundred guys, however many are going to play on Sunday, He's trying to impart the knowledge onto those, into those young men, into these young men without brag, without trying to brag on myself or be that old head that tells you, you know, back in my day, et cetera, et cetera. And I try to, I, I break that and I encourage when, when, if there's any young man that listens to this podcast and anybody that's speaking into this podcast, I encourage them to either listen or teach and tell with the mindset and make it clear that I'm only telling you this to this extent with this amount of detail about myself because this is the only story I know this way. I can tell you about Kobe. I can tell you about Shaq. I can tell you about Dion. I can tell you about Barry, Richard Dent. I can tell you about Reggie White. I can tell you about these people. But I don't know every in and out of their story this way. So when I'm telling you this or when you're listening to this, understand, I'm not telling you because I'm full of myself. I'm telling you because this is the only information I can give you top to bottom, in and out, every I dot and every T crossed this way. It worked out for me, and the the information that you're yearning for, fortunately, by the grace of God, I've been blessed with to be able to experience so I can tell you how it helped me get there. This is not going to be your answer or your solution, but I can only provide you with the details that I have. So that way when you approach this same situation, when you get into these same similar scenarios, you're equipped with some type of tool or knowledge to be able to navigate those waters. And you'll only have those if you listen to what I'm saying from an understanding that I'm only telling you because this is I can give you the exact details and the exact thought process of the exact moment of that day of scenario. And you can only impart that knowledge if you make it clear to people that I'm only telling you because this is the way I can do it. If you listen, if you listen because of that, and if you tell with that intent and that purpose and kind of that underlying intention, if you will, I believe now you can make progress in delivering that message. And so trying to impart that, that knowledge onto my, my, my student athletes is hard because I have to break through the barrier of them thinking I'm the old guy that had to stretch to the, the field in 13 feet of snow, 26 miles, and below freezing temperature with boots with holes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that, is, that is the big challenge of, of trying to do that, and I, I encourage anybody who's listening or anybody who wants to listen. And when you hear somebody talk, yeah, just take them at face value at that they're not bragging on themselves, but they're only telling the story that they know best, which is their own. Amen. So my, my advice to a young man that wants to play in the pros is real simple. Where are you at right now? And what are you doing to be a pro right now? So much so that it reveals your talent on Saturdays on the field. Yep. So that's what teams want you. Because so many guys are like, like, like holding back. I'm, well, when I get to the pros, I'm going to work hard. Well, dude, you ain't going to get to the pros. You know, hey, when I get to the pros, I'm going to be coachable. Well, that starts, that, that started in middle school, but it, it better start today. And so right. what I tell guys is, dude, you're in the pros right now. You're just in the minor leagues. And you ain't ever going to get called up if you don't take care of your business right now. One of the things that's really difficult is when you're in the when your NFL career is over, even if you're Tom Brady, you're still a young man in the whole scheme of things. And especially if you don't let's say you don't make it to thirty. You have a you have a good NFL career but you don't hit thirty. You're still in your twenties. And if you're a law firm, you're still working your way up to try to become partner. If you're a banker, you're still you know, at the director level, you're not even smelling the presidency at, the, at that moment, whereas yeah. an NFL player has hit the pinnacle in his 20s. And yeah. it's probably the, one of the biggest challenges guys have when their careers are, careers are over is, okay, how do I fit into the real world? How do I have the same amount of juice, adrenaline, and high, so to speak, 
in, in a real job that you had in the NFL. So my question, my last question for you, Greg, is when you were finished, you, you had an internship with NFL at their mm-hmm. league office, and now you're employed by, you know, a university. How do you get that same adrenaline high that you had when you played? Um, and maybe you yeah, don't. Yeah, no, I, I think it's simple. Um, but it's all, it's a gift and a curse because it's easy to fulfill whatever – it's easy to fulfill that kind of – that missing link when you play because if I know I need to work on this or work on that or I've been studying this move and I get to work it out or try it out at practice or whatever, man, the satisfying feeling of it work or failing and then going back to the drawing board or trying this or doing something, like, it's easy. So that same drive applies. I believe you have it in you. I really do. I think that's what separates a lot of guys who play and can play a long time. I mean – now I'm going to be the braggadocious guy that I know I could have played 10 years in the league if my knees didn't give out because I was always trying to figure out a way on how to be better. A lot of our conversations and phone calls was, how, Greg, how how do I do this better? How, you know, or what what about this? Or talking to somebody and learning. So, so like, I believe you have it in you. How you find that same type of drive when, when, when kind of navigating the waters in, in the building that I'm in, the gift part of it is it pushes me to continuously strive to figure out a way to be better and to be the best and to do things so that my student athletes leave here and say, like, man, I really appreciate it, Coach Scruggs, not because I need it, but because they felt like they had somebody to care for them. That's the gift part of it. The curse is you'll never truly satisfy that. It's, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible because we, we shoot to bat 1,000. When we play the game, I shoot to execute this move and to get this sack. I don't have a sack. There is no there is no measurable statistic because there's so many other people who play parts in, in these student athletes' lives that you can't attribute it to one thing. I can only attribute my part, which is immeasurable, it's abstract. So the gift is that it pushes me to constantly try to figure out the next thing to make it better for these guys or be better for them, but the curse is that I'll never, ever fulfill that gap. And some people would say that's what determines and that's what leads people to success is because the best people always are constantly searching for a way to get better, and it leaves you yearning for more and for more and for more. That's why Tom Brady makes sense to me because I I was in the locker room with a dude who I know yearned for more and was always yearning to be more perfect. That's how you – like kind of fulfill that adrenaline rush. I mean, I, for example, we just something just went through last week that I I went home and I felt like I had just accomplished something big. I mean, like you know, I had a conversation with some people here at the university and I felt like we had just accomplished. Like man, I, I I said I wanted to get something like that done. It looks like the wheels are going to be in motion and that's good. And I went home and I felt good. And then I woke up the next day trying to figure out, okay, that was yesterday. <laughs> What's next? And so it's comparable in football because it's the same way I approach the day, which, allowed, which made me walk into the building every day wondering if I was going to get cut, which is why I felt like I couldn't slack or the camera was always on me, which is why I, it's the same way I played college ball. You know, one of the greatest compliments I got from a guy, um, not only who I played ball with, but a guy who watched tape on me and said, You'll be hard pressed to turn on college tape when Scrubs is in the game and not see him running in towards the end of the film. He, I mean, that's not 100% true. It might only be 85% true. But for the most part, majority of my career, you could find me on the tape. If I was on the field, you could see me on before the tape cut to the next play. Um, Greg, let and, me interject here. Let me summarize what I just heard. Yep. Okay. Number one, you put hustle and, ener- and energy and effort into what you do. Mm-hmm. Because whatever you do after football, if you're not putting, you know, hustle, energy, and effort into it, you're not going to be your best. Yep. The second thing is you describe striving to get better. You're not complacent. You're not content. You're not being lazy. You're trying to get better at whatever you do. Yep. And the third thing is you look for wins. There is a scoreboard. And mm-hmm. sometimes the scoreboard's different. It doesn't have numbers on it. it. doesn't light up. Not everybody sees it. Sometimes that scoreboard is invisible. It's only seen by you. But you have to look for wins in the building, wins in your your job responsibilities, wins in your department. Yeah. 
Is that a fair summary? That's fair. Yeah. Right. Only, only, only kind of. So I was listening. Yeah, yeah. The only, yeah. The only <laughs> thing uh, I won't. I will say. Excuse me. Is that I don't necessarily. I don't frame it, and I don't wake up in the day looking for wins, which is kind of hypocritical because I tell all my student athletes who are going through re- rehabs and who have had minor setbacks, I always challenge them to find a small win that day. That's what I always challenge them to do: is find a small, small win that day. Um, and I wake up not trying to find a small win, but to just progress the program or my position or my job or my um, agenda forward. And whether it's a win or not, I have no idea. But all I know is that I was doing my best or I did my best or I made an effort to try to push that agenda forward. And so it may sound like searching for wins, but for me, it's not. Because then I'd be applying a value to everything that I'm doing or every person that I meet with that. And I don't want anybody to have value. Everybody is their own unique person and can assess their own unique value. I only am trying to progress the agenda forward for the benefit of the student athlete. And I'll let somebody else say, well, that's a win or a loss. I'm with you, man. Thank you for listening to this episode of Pro Mindset. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Five stars, of course. You can follow us on our website, promindsetpodcast.com or on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Pro Mindset Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you the next time.